I've extracted just seven and a half minutes of Sue Roof's hour-long detailed presentation of architectural design. I've chosen them to show and encourage discussion on how we might cope with our changing climate. Pay attention to the different ways she copes with climate change, and not so much to the architecture. The same methods apply to other areas of our life, pollution, agriculture, water, biodiversity, and even to our decision-making and management. So if you're sitting comfortably, let's begin. Most of us live in older buildings, don't we? And a va uh, vernacular which was climate savvy, you know, developed, adapted to the local climate and conditions, yeah? Hang on here, suddenly we had an energy crisis in the 70s. Oil was drying up and energy was, prices were doubling, tripling, quadrupling. And we got this whole new sort of passive solar, solar building. Better windows, so you put in the double glazing, you're look, putting it more insulation, you're getting rid of cold bridging and you're getting rid of drafts you put a little heat recovery system in or something. That's basically the mantra of the passive house. Okay, so let, let's just look at it in terms of the evolution of building types. Passive house, 1990s, energy efficiency, insulation, good windows, airtight, no thermal bridging, heat recovery. It has an overheating problem and it's not suitable for many climates. There is a fallacy about efficiency, yeah? And this is the difference between efficiency and sufficiency. What is sufficient energy to do the work you need to do in an office? Okay, so that was the 90s. Let's get on to the noughties. We suddenly all discovered sustainability. Yeah. Well, I don't know if anybody else is as confused as I was about it. Because sustainability was ooh, a great big basket full of things and water and health, community type, stuff like that. We got Active House from Denmark. A lot more is comfort, energy, environments. Okay, we have now resilience. We're beginning to get a taste that climate change is going to be really, really challenging. By 2100, sea level rises won't be one meter as predicted. They'll be two meters. I think we need to future-proof and make climate ready, but we also have to understand adaptive opportunities and controls, and we have to see people as part of the solution. So that's resilience, okay? And this is where I think adaptive design is going to be absolutely critical. Now, how does this affect you? Because I think it affects all of you, your children, your families. What you have to do now is not see the building as simply a series of building system flows, you know, electricity and water and stuff like that. You have to reconnect so the building becomes part of the ecosystem. So reconnect the building to what's around it. But I'm proposing here a three-step design process. I think you start with a piece of paper and a pencil. You work out what steps you've got to take. Number one, design the building that will be there for 100 years, 200 years, 500 years. That's everything you can't change about a building. If you, We're in a building that's from 1762, was it? Yeah. You design what it's made of, the mass in it, the orientation, the holes in it, um, the height of the rooms. You design uh, the depth in the ground. You design structural overhangs and so on. Um, in that first step, that's where the mistakes are made or the battle is won or lost. The second level is all the things you can change about a building. It's the adaptive opportunities. Things will have been changed, the lights, the boiler, the window glazing, the levels of insulation. You can change all that. That's a secondary thing, the mechanical stuff. Um, and here's Norch's um, terraced house, her adaptive terraced house, and she showed that she could run it on 80% less energy. 
simply by using her range of strategies. Why does this matter? Because so many HVAC engineers, if you take a so-so building, only know how to put in a mechanical solution. They are not taught about how to calculate the mass, generally how to calculate the natural ventilation. If the architects took more responsibility from an early stage and provided really good passive heating, cooling, shutters, you know, adaptive opportunities, a lot of passive ones, then the mechanical heating and cooling solutions could be absolutely minimized. And then we get to the top note, which is the architecture thing. And this is what I call the wow to well-being. And many, many young architects go out of schools of architecture thinking that their function in life is to create wow moments. Um, you, and the, the sort of spiritual well-being, I think there's a shift over to that way now. I mean, you, you imagine coming home, hello, dear, I've got your big red plastic puff all ready for you to sit on it and have a look out the window. You know, or the Google thing. This is designed to keep you frenetically... Uh, producing adrenaline so you can work 14 hours a day. And this is what I've just been doing recently. Um, I'm looking at designing extreme structures. So this is one we've just put up February in Antarctica, um, based on a, um, a yurt but with really innovative materials. And if, if you want extremelodge.org, we're going back next February to see if it's withstood 12 months in 200 kilometer an hour winds in the extreme cold. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because we are all of us, we don't know our own limits until we go beyond them and look back. And um, what I found there, and I was there with two Portuguese colleagues um, in this remote site in Collins Glacier, was that we were working in this design beyond the limits of our knowledge, but also beyond the limits of our imagination. And so by doing it, you suddenly open a new world into what extreme design might mean. Anyway, I hope that was interesting.